I was a restaurateur prior going online and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. That place burned down to ashes, literally, caught on fire midday during service and I had no insurance. I lost about half a million dollars that I had invested over three years. And then a few months later, I learned about this online thing. We innovated, we figured out this thing. January, 2021, our business did 150,000. January of 2022, we did 2.3 million. Bashar Katu, I appreciate you carving out some time, man. It's good to see you. Good to see you, man. Thank you for having me. Of course. So uh, you have been a client of Easy Pay Direct for a while, yes. and I've gotten to see the uh, the company grow. Uh, and more recently, I've kind of dug into the background of how it started to happen. Um, but you are one of these people that has seemingly built um, a, a sizable business uh, through leveraging social media. So you've created some funnel uh, in social, and I want to dig into that part of it, but Rewinding a little bit, uh, I guess, first and foremost, can you give me some idea of size and scope of the current operation? So up until uh, last last year, I guess, um, well, we, I mean, shit. If you had asked me that question two years ago, it would have been different than last year. It would have been different than today. But we went from like five people in 2020 to 122 people in 2022, late 2022 multiple eight figures, uh, both 2021, 2022. And then we kind of, over the last few months, we've hit like a kind of like a nosedive. And that's kind of the thing that mm. I was telling you about uh, of like going from a real, from an offer to a real company. Right now we're about 38, 39 people, 37 people. Wild. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's dig into that, but let's start at the beginning. So uh, uh, we were talking a minute ago and you said that you started as a restaurant tour yes. uh, with, I think you said not a great culture no. and uh, weren't enjoying the the physical um, community that you had uh, that you were overseeing. <laughs> so why don't we start there? What was that about and how'd you transition? Well, I, I was raised by a father who um, who told me that, you know, you're the boss, you know, and everyone else is just an employee. And in order for mm. for for the boss to be the boss, you can't be your employee's friend, you know? And uh, because there's that invisible line, once they pass it, it's like you can't tell them what to do anymore. So he would literally walk around my place and every time he'd see me talking to my employees, he would like come and tell me, stop talking to them, you know? Um, and so I had this like inner conflict of like, these are cool people that I want to hang out with and become friends with. But then I have my father in the back of my mind saying, you need to be a boss and for you to do that, you can't be their friend. And so because I, I had that conflict, you know, and, and I was a 23-year-old kid owning a business, managing tens of employees. I just didn't have the experience. I had too big of an ego. I had all this all this conflict happening. And uh, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know how, how I was running the place. And, and it's not only about did I not know what I was doing, but I wasn't aware of aware enough to ask for help. Although I mm -hmm. was, you know, it was being... Uh, uh, um, uh, proposed to me every now and then because people really cared and really wanted the, the the establishment to grow. And so that whole environment just became toxic because people did not feel appreciated. Uh, I I thought they sucked, you know, because I was working 120 hours a week. I was, a, you know, just a hardworking guy that's like, there, you know, I don't believe in no's. It's like everything is possible. And, uh, and there was people with limited mentalities, but then they didn't feel appreciated. So the whole thing was just a mess, to be honest with you. Um, in that, that place burned down to ashes, literally, uh, caught on fire midday during service. And I had no insurance, you know, one of my unpaid bills was my insurance oh, bill. Oh shit. Yeah. So I, I lost about half a million dollars that I had invested over three years, came out of the 150 K in debt. And, uh, and then a few months later, I learned about this online thing and that became hold an on, escape. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. So. Your business burned to the ground. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of restaurant was it? It was uh, like a pizzeria sit down type of place. Okay. So sit down. So you had servers, yeah. uh, which managing servers anyway is a, is an interesting dynamic, right? Because it's high tip, low wage, high turnover typically. And you were, so you were uh, running in the red. You hadn't play, paid the insurance bill. That's how you ended up with no insurance. Yes. Oh man. Yes. Uh, um, okay, so that's brutal. Uh, was that? Were you making any money with that restaurant? 
No, I I don't think I ever made any money. Like in, in terms of like, you know, taking the whole three years, it, it never made money. Do you think that that was because, well, why was that? Because now you're doing seemingly a good job, but I, and we'll get into specifics of the numbers now. What do you think it was about that proposition? Do you think it was solely the leadership side of things? As you said, the dynamic between you and the employees, or was there something else there? No, I, I take full responsibility for it, you know? Um, it was a combination of being young, with you know lack of experience, having a big ego to ask for help, and because like lack of experience is never an excuse because there's like it's not like I'm 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 trying to go to Mars you know people have done this before you know so mm-hmm. it's about how to understand what you lack and then trying to I guess you could say cover that with someone else that has those skills and so I knew everything I had all the answers to everything no one knew more than me. You know, and so there is a level of of like incompetence in 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 saying, okay, I am, I lack these experiences. I need to go and find someone who has these 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 skills to help me. Uh, and so that that wasn't even like that did not exist for me. You know, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, many times until today, I I um, I struggle sometimes with ego. I mean, it's it's not anywhere near what it used to be, but. I don't know. I don't know if it's maybe because uh, of the culture that I was that I grew up in, um, whatever it is. Whether if I you know uh, inherited it from my father or something, I'm not sure. But it's um, it's one of those things that it's always like a constant struggle of because I think ego is, is important. Like you need to have some ego, otherwise you'll get run over. But it's like when is it too much? Where it's just like blinding you, and it was completely blinding me then. Lots of thoughts and ego, but I, I think that this will unfold a little bit as we talk about your story. So you found the online thing. Uh, when you say that, how did you get introduced to it? What was it? Yeah, so I, I, had, a fr- I, um, I had a high school friend that I reunited with a few months after uh, my, um, my restaurant burned down. And he said, you know, we're talking, what do you do for a living, blah, blah, blah. I had told him what I was doing. And he said he works from home. And to me, it just didn't make any sense. I was like, what do you mean you work from home? How do you work from home? Like, do you, do you have like a, a home office where people come to you and you do business for them? Or so? like, what, is, what exactly is it? It's like, no, I work online. And at the time, I think I was doing marketing for an agency. I don't know exactly. I don't remember what he was doing. But it was just the concept that he was from his house, on his computer, on the internet, making money that really intrigued me, you know? Sure. And so coming out of that experience of like, I don't want to deal with people anymore. I was very <laughs> intrigued. I, you know, got online, started researching how to make money online, and I found, I mean, everything there, anything that you find today, real estate, crypto, affiliate marketing, e-commerce, all that stuff. And um, and you know, Amazon was one of them, and it just stuck with me, you know, and I it sounded really good, and I started digging into it, you know, launched some products, failed, finally realized that okay, I probably need to learned from someone that knows what they're doing, bought a course, figured out a few things, launched a few more products, those did well. And then that kind of became what it is today. Yeah. So today the the core company, BJK, is teaching people how to uh, build Amazon stores. Is that the gist of it? Yeah. I mean, essentially four years into building an Amazon uh, store for myself, realized that, okay, I can make good money with this. Um, and this is a, a very lucrative skill that, that, you know, not only I can benefit from, but other people can benefit from. Few friends had found out, they started asking me for help, started helping them out. They were getting results. And I realized that, okay, I can not only do it for myself, I can help others do it. It's a, it can be a lucrative business. And so I'm helping other people at the same time, building myself another stream of, uh, you know, revenue stream. And then probably about a six, eight months into it, I realized that I had more passion for, teaching people and educating people and improving their lives than just focusing on my own thing. And so I just kind of went all, went all into it. Um, the first two years, it was just focused around Amazon. Now the plan is to branch out of just e-commerce and Amazon and go into other verticals, teaching people different skills. So just like a university, you don't just go to, you know, to, to get an engineering degree or to get this thing or that thing. There are all these avenues that you can take and they all lead to the same road, which is, I guess you could say financial freedom or, or having, improving your life, you know? So that's essentially what, what, uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, the, what strikes me about that is the transition around 
kind of your core interests. And I want to, I want to dive into the current company because I think that that's, there's a lot of learning there, but, um, initially the allure seemed to be, Hey, here's this thing, um, where I can control my destiny, right? I can work from home and what I'm selling isn't as important as the vehicle. And you said you tried to sell a few different products and didn't get them to work. And, and tell me if I didn't get that right. But you then moved to something where you said the language you used was, I'm, I was more interested and passionate about teaching people how to do it than selling a product. Do you think that, first off, is that accurate? Or were you into the products that you were selling on Amazon? You had some interest in them. Um, no, it wasn't an interest. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't <laughs> that, you know, I was... Um, like 80% of the products that I sold on Amazon, I've launched over 100 products since I started. Uh, mm -hmm. Over 80% of the products that I've sold on Amazon, I didn't even know existed until I found them. You know, so mm -hmm. it wasn't like um, like a like a passion. I, we have like maybe 10, 20% of our students come to us and they're like, hey, I've got this thing. I've got an invention. I, I'm really passionate about this thing. I built this thing and I have retail stores and I want to take it online so they have their own product that they're like passionate about. For me, it wasn't, wasn't about that I was passionate about the product. It was more of a business that I utilized to clear my debt, to, to retire my parents, marry my wife. And, um, and it just, it was a business. That's all, that's literally all it was. It was about finding a, a good product, delivering a good product in a convenient way to my customers in the cheapest way possible where they can win and I can make a profit and, uh, and then scaling those as much as possible. Now that you're, you know, multi eight figure, do you have any strong feelings about uh, whether it makes sense about, I should say, the best path for an entrepreneur to pursue something that they're driven by passionately versus pursuing a business for the sake of uh, the financial outcome? Um, you know, I've always had mixed feelings about this, about like following your passion or not. If you if you're five years old and you picked up a soccer ball and you're just really good, or you you know you dunked a basketball and you're like six five and you're like ten years old or something like that, if you you know if you're just a great quarterback or a great singer or whatever, and you realize that early on, then you have a skill. You know you're this is like a I could you know you could say it's a, it's a God giving skill. You know you should follow that. You should pursue that because that's something that you were technically born with, and it can probably become very lucrative into providing you with a great life. Um, otherwise, for the average person like you and I, um, or maybe your story is different, but you know, I know for me personally, I, I didn't have any God-given skills. You know, it was just hard work. Um, and there was no passion involved because I went into business trying to make money. That's all it was. And then when that failed, I went into business again because I wanted to get out of that rut and go, get out of that that debt and get out of all the the, the BS that came, you know, after it. Uh, so it was just I was in survival mode pretty much. It was like I'll do anything and everything. I don't care as long as it pays, you know. Um, but then I think there is a level where you get to a certain level where now you need to go from scarcity to abundance, you know. And that's the thing that I've been trying to navigate, you know? And when you go there, because, you know, you get to a point, let's say if you don't have any debts, if you're driving a nice car, if you live in a nice home, you have a nice life, you're making, I don't know, whatever, 10, 20, 30 grand a month, take home. It's like, that's not normal. You know, like if you're making 20 grand a month and take home, like that's not normal. Quote a million dollars a year of take home, that's not normal. You know, that's not like an average or anything. The average household uh, 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 income in America, I think it's about 50 or, or 60K. So it's like three, four times that. That's not normal, right? And so there's that threshold where like life is different now, you know? the the You could hustle and stuff like that. That's cool. But it's like there's going to be something that's driving you that's more than just the money. Otherwise, you will get to a point where it's like, what am I doing all this for? You know, because business mm. is not easy. You know, like yesterday I I opened my laptop after, you know, uh, uh, being excited to go and do something awesome. And I got a resignation letter from someone that I was not expecting to resign. And it literally yes. punched me in the gut because I was like, fuck, we're finally going to go into a stabilizing quarter. Like literally Q3, I was like, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to stabilize. We've launched three programs in the last literally two weeks. 
let's just stabilize everything we have. Let's get us, you know, uh, uh, back to going back up again and stuff like that. And then I got that and I'm like, holy shit. So now literally my world got turned upside down all day yesterday trying to navigate what is the next step, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, like business people don't do it for the faint of heart. You know, like you and I both know it's like there's BS all the time. The reason why I found you guys was because I got kicked out of my other, you know, uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, 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 merchant uh, account. Merchant account. And then I found you guys, you know? And that's a whole nother story we can go into later. But um, there has got to be a driver. Like I literally sat there yesterday. And I'm like, why am I doing all this? Like, yeah. what the hell is it all for? Like, I'm tired, man. I'm just tired, you know? And then after 15 minutes, it's like, no, because you have a why now. It's not about the money mm. anymore. You know, it's there's a strong why that's pulling you. It's not about you anymore. It's not about you or just the 40 people that you employ or it's about other people. And that's, I think, that shift has to happen. Otherwise, you'll, you'll you know, something like this will happen and you'll be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to fold and go fuck off, get a job or something like that. And that's it, you know? Yeah, I tend to believe that um, a lot of people get in their own way in the pursuit of that why and never get started as a result. And so I, I both agree with you. I think we're going to say the same thing, but... I, I agree that there, there is a point at which you have to find something that's pulling you in the direction you want to go. You have to find another reason to do it other than just money. And it could be the love of the game if you actually do love it. And there are some people that just love it. Um, or it's got to be something else. But in the meantime, while you figure that shit out, just do something. <laughs> yeah. Because you're more likely to figure it out if you get some reps in and start producing uh, and creating and designing and iterating and solving problems um, than if you just sit there on your couch and think about it. Um, so it, more often than not, for me, I find people that find purpose or passion or a why later in their business journey versus the entrepreneur that starts and has some magical thing pulling them from day one. Right. Um, so you got started online you had some stores on Amazon. You had a few products that started to do well. Um, and then you started BJK to sell products. Tell me about that journey because... Uh, I, I, well, tell me about that journey. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, when you were going from zero to a million, what was different then versus, let's say, today in terms of your marketing? What were the iterative paths there? Well, in the beginning, I think it's, it's just about getting something out there that people want. You know, I think a lot of people get get uh, get um, get very busy with like busy work, um, and they forget that you know, just because you have something to sell doesn't mean there are people to, that that want to buy it. You know, um, like I remember I'd be I'd be you know joining webinars and just kind of seeing like what the competition is doing, and I'd look at their stuff and it's like, dude, this guy does not know what the hell he's talking about. You know, and then I'm here like I have this great offer, this great product, like I will do anything. Here's my cell phone. Call me. at Literally, that that was my offer. It's like I will get you the results. My pro my program is three ninety nine. It's lifetime access. It's it's anything and everything you want. I will do one on one with you every single day if you want me to. Here's my WhatsApp. You want to message me on Facebook? No problem. You want to message me on my cell phone? No, like literally whatever you want, you know, and no one was buying. Um, so first you got to find a, a product market fit. Like do people actually want what you're selling, you know? And then you just got to do it. You just got to go out there and like, just do it. Put it in the hands of people. The biggest reason, the reason why we got kicked off of Stripe and this, and, and how I found you, because you log into the program, I was selling to nine to fivers, a bunch of people that have never launched a, a, a business in their lives. And my program was just complicated as shit. You know, they'd come in and it's like video one, week one, how to find a product. And here's like this hour and a half long video and people would watch it get overcomplicated. Like, what is this shit, you know? Uh, because for me, it's like, look, I want actionable stuff. Like I want someone to tell me what, it, what to do. Give me it all in 30 minutes and let me go do it. But then it's like, dude, you can't just make it for you. It's like, think of the other person. Like, but you got to, Remove yourself from your shoes and put yourself in your customer's shoes. So we started getting a bunch of refunds. We started getting a bunch of disputes. And for me, it was like, screw yourself, man. I'm giving you all this and you're still, and you're disputing, like go screw yourself. 
And then until, you know, Stripe was like, we're not doing business anymore with you. You got three days to get the hell out of, you know, get, get the hell off of our, our platform. And then I was stuck, Ooh. you know, I tried Square, I tried this, I tried that, and it was stuck until I found you guys. And then since then, it's like, okay, well, maybe there's something here. <laughs> you know, like, like if they don't want you on their platform, is that normal for everyone else? And then I started asking around. I was like, no, that's not normal, man. There's something wrong with your program. Okay, well, you got to start looking within. And, and, you know, I think like the lesson learned there, it's like, it's very easy to point fingers at people. And the hardest thing is like taking responsibility and saying, okay, where did I fuck up? How can I fix it? Because at the end of the day, you can control your actions and your reactions, but you can't control how other people show up. Like, again, I, I looked at this resignation letter yesterday and I'm like, after everything that I've done for you, are you kidding me? I did fuck up the week before. I said something that I, you know, hindsight 2020, looking back at it, it's like, well, I could have probably communicated my, 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 um, my message with a better, you know, word choice. Uh, but it's like, are you serious? Like, we've been together for almost two years now, this one thing, and now you hold it against me. So I started there, but then I was like, wait a second, let me take responsibility. What, what can I learn from this? Got on a call, is there anything we can do? Person is fixated on, this is just the best thing for both of us, no problem. What's the, the next step? Take responsibility because you could fix that, you know, where if you don't take responsibility, you can't fix that, you know what I mean? I do, yeah. I, I love the self-awareness around that. Um, the people that I want to spend time with in life in general are those that take ownership of their actions entirely. And I have a fundamental belief that there are very few absolutes in life and you can always do something about your outcomes. Now, sometimes you can have a ton of control in the action you take and how it impacts the outcome. And sometimes you can barely move the needle. So you can't control everything, but you can always have an influence. So let's let's jump into, I want to talk about, like I like the, the mindset behind that um, and the ownership with it, but I'm curious about the sort of marketing tactics uh, outside of just product and delivery and creating a good product. Um, curious about the marketing tactics that brought you to the current state. Um, when we started, you talked about product versus brand and that making that transition right now, which presupposes that it had been about different, I'm sorry, offers versus brand. It had been about different offers along the journey, but you know, you, you built a multi eight figure company through offers. So what was the marketing path like? And when did it spike? Did you have a jump off point where all of a sudden there was a significant, uh, change in volume? Tell me about that, that, uh, that journey. Yeah, so there is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the book, um, uh, Organizational Physics. Um, I have not. Uh, great book. Not, not, very, not a very big read, but um, it essentially says that the, uh, the cycle of any business, any, any pro product, any project, anything really, there is three cycles. There is um, innovation, there is production, there is stabilization. So you innovate, you find something, you crack the code on something, there's that new S-curve, right? Uh, and then you start producing and you just produce, produce, produce. And then after you produce a bunch, then you got to stabilize, right? So uh, whatever it is, you did a launch, you know, you got to X amount of units per week, per month, per day, whatever it is, and then you got to stabilize there. And then you innovate again, you produce, you innovate, uh, you stabilize and so on. So for us in 20, late 2020, I had tried I mean, I, I started my business, uh, my consulting business organically, just communicating with people on Facebook, getting them on the phone, closing them myself, and then went to Facebook, Instagram ads until one day I woke up and my ad account was shut down, um, which, you know, literally, like, I don't even know how many, how many people have had that issue. And then from there, I went to YouTube trying to make that work and I just couldn't figure it out. Um, and then I found out about this thing called Instagram shoutouts, you know, and this was mm. pretty early on. So this was late 2020. Met a couple of guys and we innovated, we figured out this thing and then bam, you know, so just kind of giving you a perspective based on numbers, January, 2021, our business did 150,000 or something like that. January of 2022, we did 2.3 million. Wow. Um, so, you know, like 12X, 13X, whatever the number is. And that was because we had 
um, we had innovated. We found, you know, we innovated Instagram shout outs. No one really did it at the level we were, we were spending about, on average in 2022, we spent about $325,000 a month on shout outs. I don't think anyone mm. else in the industry has done it. You know, now you could argue that someone like Fashion Nova or, you know, these companies have done it way bigger. But yeah, I mean, like in the, in our, you know, uh, uh, like online education industry um, and at, at the scale, at the profit that we did. And, um, and we were operating like five, six X ROIs. And so we scaled a ton. Now, what we should have done in 2022 was, okay, we innovated, we produced, now let's stabilize. Mm. But what we did is we got stuck in innovation and well, really we got stuck in, in production because mm -hmm. we innovated once and then we just kept on wanting to produce. And so January was our highest month ever in the company. And then from there it was just a continued continue decline uh, because what, what we lacked is like, we skipped so many business levels, you know, because you go from one to five, five to 10 to, you know, and it's like, we just, we like leaked, you know, we went from, I don't know, we went from like a million dollar business to a, like a 12, 13, well, 2022, we closed the year with 16 and a half. So almost a $20 million business without systems, without processes. I did not have a mm. finance and admin department, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I didn't have an operations team. I had a coaching team and a, and a customer service team, but I didn't have an operations team. Um, we didn't have our systems and processes documented. We didn't have real tracking. It was a bunch of we were doing about 500,000 zaps every single month. Oh, God. It was a bunch of stuff literally go flying <laughs> everywhere. It was, you know, <laughs> Google Sheets upon Google Sheets. And yeah. as Amazing. we, yeah, and as we like kept on going, you know, obviously hindsight 2020, look back and it's like, what the fuck were we thinking? You know, like, <laughs> how are we supposed to operate business like this? Um, yeah. But again, it's like, you know, just being a visionary CEO, I'm just like, I want to go. I want to go a million. It's yeah. like, you know, because for us, it was like, we got to 2 million a month. We can go to 10 million a month. Let's keep going. Yeah. You know? Um, all right. So I've got a bunch of questions on that because the, first of all, uh, the, the, I think the biggest lesson for most people that are in the, you know, post 1 million mark, a few million or more is that your systems don't need to be perfect to drive more revenue. And you can just dump gas on it and get more revenue in. And there are lots of different approaches to this. Like you said, um, seeing innovation as a phase and then production as a phase before stabilization. Uh, but people do that differently. Plenty of people want to create a stable system as they're growing or stabilize before they put gas on it, right? Um, and so there's not one way, but for all of the OCD perfectionists out there, you got to know that you can grab Zapier and some sheets <laughs> and just dump gas on the fire and grow. So yeah. I think that that's awesome. Um, but I want to I want to drill into the model specifically because I'm familiar with uh, the shout outs. And I know a lot of our clients have driven business that way uh, inside the walls of Easy Pay Direct. But can you break down uh, what that how that model worked for you? Like, what is that uh, sales cycle and what was the funnel? Um, and to be clear, this is selling one one offer which is learn how to create a store on Amazon. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. it's just a mentorship offer, um, $4,800. And that was the other problem, right? Uh, there wasn't lifetime value for, to the customer. But, um, but yeah, so the, the, just to kind of break down the model, um, it, it's an ecosystem. It lives in an ecosystem and it's two parts. Uh, so there's the, the content, there's the, the, actual, um, the actual like paid ads or the, the shout outs. One doesn't work without the either. It has to be both at this, like both together, you know? Mm. Um, so the way that we grew, we grew from like, I think 25,000 followers. In, and this is, you know, as our followers grew, our, our revenue grew, uh, 25,000 followers, I think in uh, 2000 and um, uh, January, 2021 to January, 2022, we had about 2 million followers. So we literally grew more than 2 million, almost 2 million followers in like a year, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the way that the ecosystem works is you have a content strategy that you're posting on your page. So ours, for us, it was sliders and video uh, reels, like short 30 seconds, 60 second reels. And we have our own strategy of like how to find the con viral content and stuff like that. So you'd post, 
We're posting between four to six times a day there. And then there is the shout outs uh, strategy. So the shout outs is reaching out to motivational pages, people in the business niche, and then just simply having your top content that performed on your page be the piece to shout out. But then instead mm -hmm. of telling people, click the link in my bio, you tell them to follow your page. So from there, what they do is they go, they click on, on the caption, they follow your page, and then through your content, you tell them to convert and uh, to click the link in bio. And the funnel was a, a, a video sales letter funnel, so a VSL funnel. It was a opt-in page, video, 20-minute video, uh, survey, book a call, confirmation, and then from there, it's a sales rep. It was about a two-week two -week sales cycle. Awesome. Super helpful. So you started by saying that it was shout outs and I think you said ads, but then you talked about what sounded like organic, what sounded like creating reels and a bunch of content. Um, were you putting money behind the reels and driving them that way or were you boosting them? How did that work? No, no. So what I meant by ads is like that was our paid ads, which was the shout outs. Like the shout outs were Got like it. we were paying to play, right? So yeah, that's yeah. like our quote unquote paid ads. Um, Got it. But the organic content is just organic for our followers. So people that followed us found, saw our content. And then from there, every single piece of content had a CTA, which is click the link in my bio if you want to learn more. And then they go through the VSL funnel. Got it. So all content had CTAs to push back to the bio. That's interesting. Yeah. And, yep. and you were doing uh, or are doing four to six a day, which is a lot um, of a stuff. Lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, tell me about the... Uh, so I want to talk about the, well, yeah, let's talk about the, um, how you ideate that. How do you, what's the process like to decide what content you're going to make? How deliberate is it? How often do you shoot? How do you break that apart? Because this is your whole model, right? It's everything you're focused on. Um, we both know people that, uh, I mean, shit, myself included, where, um, they're trying to figure out the best path to integrate organic into their current marketing model? How do you add it as a, as a channel to get traffic through and aren't doing a good job of it? And so I think that the nuances of how you design that are highly relevant, whether it's your whole model or it's something that you're trying to add. Uh, how did you approach that and how'd you ultimately figure it out? So the system was, uh, there is, I think four, it's an assembly line. The content goes through an assembly line and there's four pieces. There's four checkpoints pretty much. So first you have an idea finder. So you have someone that's out there looking for viral ideas that we can make relevant to our brand. So uh, this could be on pages like Millionaire Mentor or Wealth or whatever, you know, just viral ideas that are happening right now. Uh, you take that and then you say, okay, how can I make this relevant to what I'm doing? So you take the idea and then you create it, you create relevancy to it. Uh, so idea finder, then it goes to copywriter. So a copywriter takes that idea and says, okay, this is how I'm going to write it in our voice. They understand the voice. They understand me. They understand how I think. They understand how I talk. And, and so that way it sounds like I am actually talking, not just some random person. Uh, and then they write it. They decide if it's video or slider. They write the slides or write the caption or write the, you know, write what they want it to look like. And then from there it goes to um, it goes to if it's a slider, it goes to graphic designer. So they 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 design the the main graphic and then all the slides and if there's a CTA or not. If it's a video that like B-roll and like clips, there's, you know, like a lifestyle stuff. You could put like just, there's a, they have like hundreds of clips from me that we've recorded over the years that they put together. They put captions and like music and stuff like that. Or if it's something that I need to shoot. So if it's something that I need to shoot, then it goes in a, into a doc. Um, and then I have a shooting day. So one, every Thursday I have blocked down where I shoot content and I do 21 pieces of content, 21, 21 shorts. Uh, so that's, th that gives them three pieces per day of, over mm. uh, a period of, of a week. Um, and that usually takes me about two hours. Um, in the beginning, it used to take like four or five hours, but now I've, I'm just used to it, right? And then, so, mm -hmm. and then the video gets uploaded. Again, goes to the graphic designer. They edit whatever they have to do. And then from there, it goes to the person that's going to post on social media. So they post it on Instagram mainly, obviously. Um, and then recently we started posting on TikTok, Facebook Reels, and YouTube Shorts. Got it. Super helpful. Are you how involved are you in the process of approving the final product that goes out, if at all, right now? Um, not really uh, in the approval process. You know, it's like the team has a process, so I just kind of provide them the resources that they need to become successful, which is recording the videos that they need me to record. Do you ever you, you ever have stuff go out where you look at it and you're like, ah, shit, I hate that. <laughs> Um, 
it's happened in the in the past more than now. Um, there was a, a point in time, and and there was a point in time where I used to look at my page and be like, I wouldn't follow this page, but it was getting good <laughs> results, you know. But now uh -huh. we're trying to integrate more of things that like, like now I look at my page and I'm like, shit, this is actually pretty valuable stuff, you know. So we've changed the way that I shoot content, especially so before. Uh, they would give me content scripts. So I would literally look mm -hmm. at my phone and then I would read a script and I would say it, read a script, you know, get in, get, get in, like, get in, get in, uh, what's the, what's the, like, put on my, my stage face, you know, every time I look at the camera and like read it and it just kind of talk like that. And I didn't exactly like it because it was all about conversion and all about, you know, that kind of stuff. Very optimized. And it sometimes it just, I don't know, it just came off weird. Like it was cringe, you know, where now mm -hmm. it's more of, they give me the idea. They give me three hooks because we test hooks every now and then. And then that hook gives me what to talk about. And I know that I have 30, 60 seconds and I have a formula. It's like, is this entertaining? Am I just going to talk about the, the three top restaurants that I like in Miami? Am I going to talk about how I like my steak? Or is it more of inspiration? I'm going to tell a short story and then a lesson learned. Am I doing a book review? This are, These are the three lessons that I learned from reading this book, you know, or whatever it is. So there's a, a formula there. And then at the end, it's like, is there a C what's the CTA? Is it click the link in my bio? Is it comment below? Is it follow my page? Is it whatever, you know? So, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, you, moving into the funnel part of it, um, you're, you were going a VSL for this, so video sales letter. So you're driving people outside of Instagram or the social platform to a page to watch something to then book a call and have a salesperson close them. Did you test that against straight to DMs? So a lot of people, a lot of our clients go, uh, the, their call to action is comment um, or shoot me a DM or comment this word and then somebody will hit them up via yeah. DM, direct message, yeah. um, and then try to close them through the DM. Yeah. So um, when we had a lot of volume coming in, we're not doing as much volume as we used to last year. Um, at the highest levels of the company, we broke Instagram DMs like about half a dozen times and Instagram mm. would keep on like restricting us from doing things because you can only, um, at some point we were getting about 1200 opt-ins a day. Um, so with that kind of volume, it was just not humanly possible to catch up. And also mm. it was just not possible to, like Instagram kept on messing with us. And then we would add like different uh, softwares like ManyChat, <laughs> Mobile Monkey, all that stuff. And then they kept on uh, breaking. And so this, and then we realized that th even if every single piece of our content, we tell people to DM us, about 30% of people will still click the link in bio, you mm. know? And we just realized it was an easier process. We do have the, uh, we have DM setters now. Uh, it's something that we implemented about six months ago or so. So we have people, because we get organically people just reaching out to us, asking questions all the time. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's people in there just, just talking to people, setting them up for setters, that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's not our main strategy though. That makes sense. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's a really important, <laughs> important lesson for people that are trying to figure out the model and getting it moving versus doing it at a greater scale. Like you said, if you have 1200 coming in, I don't know how you manage that or if you manage it, um, and it, maybe there's a way, right. But if it's getting, if you're getting throttled, you don't, right. Yeah. If they're, if they're saying, Hey, you're only allowed to respond to a hundred a day or 50 a day, then you're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I think this is honestly, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people have not cracked the whole Instagram thing. And by the way, they're not as um, like Instagram shout outs are not as um, they're not as effective as they were last year, the year before they were, they were, I mean, when we first started in 2021, that was like the best uh, 2021 first half of 2022, they, they were like, you know, we had the highest ROIs. We were getting six, seven X ROIs on average. We've gotten about four to five X ROIs. Uh, but right now we're probably getting about two, two and a half X ROIs. Um, so they're not the, they're not as, as lucrative. And this is why we're like, we've over the last four or five months, we've shifted away from full focus on Instagram, um, to like paid ads, you know, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, that kind of stuff. We started a, uh, a, a, a Facebook group as well, trying to funnel people that way. Um, but even when it was lucrative, the thing is like the cool thing about paid ads, you're going to put out an ad, you can target exactly the kind of people you want. And then there's like tracking every step of the way. Well, there's none of that with Instagram. 
you know, you don't know if like as simple and we were, we were promoting with like 300 pages. We don't know the kind of mm. traffic that's coming from each one of those pages because they're all driving traffic to our page. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have control of the kind of trap. So we were getting like 30, 40, like right now, if you look at our page, about 40% of our followers are India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, nothing against them. They're never going to be buyers for our $5,000 program. You know, now we had yep. a, a $40 program, $47 program for them, but we just can't get them the kind of result that we get our $5,000 uh, clients, you know? Um, and unless I take my entire operation to India and, and, and move myself to India, it's like, I can't afford to give them the kind of um, result and the kind of service at a $40 or even a hundred dollar offer. You know what I mean? Um, so you don't mm -hmm. have, you don't have any of those controls when it comes to Instagram. And I think this is probably why a lot of people would didn't take it as seriously or didn't just go at, you know, the, 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 what's it called? The, the go all the way because it's not as easy to figure out, you know what I mean? And to track and everything. Yeah. Uh, I get it. So today, do you regret any of those choices? Cause we opened the conversation saying offer versus brand and you're leaning in the direction of brand right now. Do you feel like you should have systemized further? Or are you happy with the path you took and the lessons you got out of it? Would you have done it any differently? I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, but it's like, you know, would I have taken on a partner when I started my restaurant? Should I have taken on a partner when I started my restaurant? Absolutely. Um, going at it by myself was the dumbest thing. I didn't know anything about restaurants, but it's like, <laughs> what if I had succeeded with my restaurant? Would I have been here? You know, um, right. I do believe, I, I don't believe in regrets. I believe that I, I had, there's a quote, I don't know who said it a long time ago. I just kind of really... Uh, I live by it. I never lose. I either win or I learn. Um, so this whole thing just been a learning lesson, man. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be the person I am today. It's like we don't come out of our mothers with a like a, a, a manual of how to do this and how to do that. It's like you just go out there and you figure it out. And um, and if you're smart enough, you reach out to people and learn through their mistakes. But I, what I've realized is, and, and maybe I'm just slow, you know, and, and I think I am slower than the normal, per, the, the average person. Um, it takes me a couple of times to really catch on to lessons. But sometimes like people, like people say, don't do this. Like we've done it and we've eaten shit. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I know I, I shouldn't do it. And six months later, I look back, I'm like, oh, I still did it. And I ate shit. <laughs> um, why didn't I just like not do it, you know? Um, sometimes you just have to like, it's like fire. It's like you just have to put your finger in and, and get burnt for you to say, oh shit, this is hot. I shouldn't do it. You know what I mean? But there's no yeah, regret. I like, yeah. I like to say that uh, I'm uh, very good at learning from my own mistakes after I make them a few times. <laughs> but I'm not very good at learning from other people's mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I guess what I was getting at or what I want to know is if you were to do it, uh, let's say you're launching a new thing right now, yeah. would you? follow the same path or would you? Um, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the lessons are more structure would have been helpful out um, of that. Well, he, there is a fine line because what you said there earlier is like there's people that get stuck in the structure, you know? Mm -hmm. I think I do believe in jump and build it as you're falling, build the plane as you're falling. But then there is a as you grow as an entrepreneur, as a company, those falls, if you don't build it in time, become a lot more severe. You know, when you're five people, when you're mm. 10 people, and you're 20 people, it's like, okay, it's just, but if you're a company that's got 500 employees, it's like, dude, if you fuck up here, like, like, forget your life and you going bankrupt or whatever. It's like, you're responsible for 500 families, not to mention your vendors and their families your clients and their families, you know, because right now if BJK University goes bankrupt, you know, okay, we're 40, I go bankrupt, whatever, man. I've, you know, I've been through it. It's like, I didn't grow up with money. It's whatever, you know, I'll figure it out again. So beyond me, it's 40 people. Okay. So that's them and their families, but you know, they'll probably go get an, a job and, and be okay. Some of them maybe will, will take a psychological hit and an emotional hit more than financial hit. But then there's the thousands, like, what about the thousands of our clients? Like, what the fuck happens to them? You know, mm -hmm. if I can't pay my employees, like, I can't provide service. And I've promised these people a certain level of service, you know? And then what about them and their employees? Uh, I mean, their, 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 their families, you know? What about the millions of people that watch me and, like, listen to my shit all the time, you know? 
Like what happens to them? I remember, um, and, and I know we're kind of coming to an end here, but I remember that uh, in 2020, I used to, two years prior to that, I used to follow Grant Cardone religiously, religiously. Every con- content piece that went out, every YouTube video, everything. And in COVID, I needed Grant to show up for me because I was fucking terrified. I was scared as shit. I didn't know what the hell was happening in the world. Like my my entire belief system had shattered because of like, the entire world is shut down. I never knew this would happen. And I remember a video of Grant Cardone. He was away somewhere and he was sitting on this. Um, he was. I remember where he was sitting. Um, he was sitting in a porch or whatever. And then this, I don't know if you remember, this is the video when he said that he had let go like uh, uh, like 50 of his employees and they had all these things going on and stuff like that. And you could see it on his face. He was scared as fuck. And just because he was... He showed up that way. It impacted me personally because I'm like, I need Grant to be Grant right now. I need him to show up like the ruthless, just like, I don't give a shit about anything. I'm going to do me. You know, I want that Grant. And he didn't show up that way. And it impacted me negatively. And I would go for about three months to snap out of it. And luckily I snapped out of it and I found my way and, and, and did that. But it's like, it's not about me anymore, man. It's about all these people out there. So it's like, I got to show up for them. You know, I don't know how we ended here, but yeah. I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me uh, let me ask you a couple uh, quick ones if you've got a couple minutes here. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, so first, you're telling people or you're teaching people how to um, build Amazon stores. Why Amazon versus their their own URL traditional e-com store? And yeah. is there a place for both? How do you see the intersection between those two things? I don't believe in competition. So is there room for both? Absolutely. Um, if you held a gun to my head, I would say Amazon all day. Um, it, many reasons. I mean, your own URL, you got to figure out the biggest, the biggest, the biggest problem that any business uh, has, which is traffic and customers, you know, 53% of all online sales happen on Amazon. So it's like people are going to Amazon with an intention to buy. You know, you don't go to Amazon to cruise around and just look at and like, Think about it. You know, you go to Amazon to buy something. So if you have a good strategy to finding the right product, putting it in front of the right customer, you're going to make sales. It just, it's about how much knowledge you have, how much, how many eyeballs can you get to your, to, to your products. So it's like, you know, they have, they have uh, logistics figured out. They have customer service figured out. You know, they, delivery. If you have your own product, it's like, how long again is it going to take for the customer to get it? Like, no thanks. You know, it's probably coming from China or coming from, you know, or you're shipping it yourself or what, you know, Amazon has all that stuff figured out. I'd rather just plug in my business into theirs and just say, thank you very much. Here's 25% of my sales. You keep it. I'll keep my my portion and let's do business together. All right. So you're uh, heavy on content four to six times a day. It's a lot to post. Um, it is almost June of 2023. How has AI impacted your content production, if at all? Oh, I mean, tremendously, man. Um, our copywriters right now, we used to have three copywriters. Right now we have one. Um, the other two, you know, we had to let go because, not because of AI, but because they just weren't as good. And then we just realized that the one person that we have right now can do the job of three more efficiently, more effectively, um, and we can pay them more, you know, so that that's good. Uh, but it's like uh, Jim Collins says, he says, uh, hire five, work them like 10, pay them like eight, you know? Um, so AI has has definitely done that. Copy, uh, video. Um, we're also able to produce uh, video uh, right now in the third of the cost that we did before. Uh, there's a lot of cool things that are happening with AI. So we're, we're very grateful for it, just uh, as long as they don't take my job. So, or maybe they won't, they will one day. I don't know, we'll see. What's the number one tip you'd give people if they're launching a business that's reliant on social to drive traffic uh, in 2023? Figure out the, con- the the organic content game before you go paid. I think, you know, a lot of people go paid first just because it's, it's quote unquote easier, but it's more expensive, you know, because like with organic, it takes your time. When you're first starting out as an entrepreneur, the thing that you have the most is time, you know, unless you're a serial successful entrepreneur, you know, you're you're Elon Musk and I've already have several billion dollar businesses. I'm not going to go. And although, you know, Elon spends the time to learn, but it's like um, when I first started my consulting business, the thing that I did have, well, not a whole lot of, but the thing that I did have was, was I had time, although I had money, but I also had a lot of time. So I figured out the organic thing, you know, and, uh, and keep it. That's the problem that 
I didn't do was that I had figured out organic on, not YouTube, but on Facebook. And I was really big on Facebook. A lot of my business came through Facebook. But once I went paid, it was just a lot of work. And instead of optimizing it, I completely dumped it. So there was that, that big, because it's profitable, right? It's like outside of time, everything is profits. Um, and that's really important for your business. It's a lot of cash injection in your business that'll help you to grow. Last one here, because I know we've got a, a hard stop. The theme here that popped up a bunch of times that we didn't really close the loop on is having an offer versus building a brand. Yes. And this is a huge conversation. And <laughs> and it's uh and, and we can, you know, if you've got a few minutes, we can stretch into it. But you built the company on an offer, which was, hey, I'll, I'll teach you how to build uh, an Amazon store and make money on Amazon. What's the difference between that and a brand? And what are you doing right now to build that into a brand versus that one offer? Yeah, so it's it's the difference between building an offer and building a company, a real company, right? And And the thing that I've noticed in this space, in this online education space, is you'll see someone come up, They'll do great. They're, you know, they're on uh, ClickFunnels stage getting the, the seven figure, the eight figure, whatever award. Everyone's talking about them. They're all over social and then they go away. And then, you know, six months later, this new person comes up and then they're great, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's talking about them. They're all on, on all podcasts and then they go away. And you only see a few people that come and then they stay and they grow and so on, right? Um, and that I believe a lot of it has to do because a lot of people build offers, not real companies. Because when you build an offer, you have a market, a uh, 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 product market fit, and it takes off and it does great. And everyone talks about you. But then that's when you get into the situation where I was in a year ago, which was, how do you take this now and build a real company out of it? How do you keep scaling? How do you, you know, maintain good co team culture, right? So it's like, how do you build systems? How do you build processes? Like this is boring shit that, you know, visionary, the typical visionary online guru doesn't want to do. They just want to make the quick buck, they want to do the offer, and then they want to do a new launch, and then they want to make a bunch of money and go on to the next thing. That's why you, yeah, I mean, I don't want to name names here, but you'll see the same person. It's like when AI is hot, they're now into AI. And then when mm. you know, crypto is hot, now they're in crypto and then NFTs, and now they have a, an NFT course. Like, dude, pick a lane. Like, what are you exactly, you know? Um, so it's the boring work that a lot of people don't want to do that gets you to a real company, you know? And so to answer a question of like, what are the things that we're doing is, you know, stabilize the, the third phase. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people get stuck in those two phases, which is innovation, production, new offer, innovation, production, new offer. And it, no one goes to stabilization. And stabiliz stabilization is building processes, building systems, uh, building longevity, you know, uh, diversifying a little bit, uh, building a sustainable company. Because for us, we built our company on one offer, one funnel, one traffic source. And I was very freaking proud of that, you know? Um, I, you know, again, that's when my ego kicked in and I was like, I'm going to show every motherfucker in this, in this, uh, in, in this industry, how I'm going to build a hundred million dollar business with one offer, one funnel, one, one, um, uh, source until Instagram decided to shut us down. And we went from a million and a half a month to $200,000 a month overnight. Um, because our, you know, the, the, the channel that brought 95% of our, of our income just disappeared overnight for two and a half months. Um, we had to let go tens of sales reps. We had to do a whole bunch of things that, you know, I wish we didn't have to do, but it's like, that's what happens when you think of, I'm not building an offer here. I'm building a real sustainable company. And you start thinking long-term, not just today, tomorrow, next month. Ah, uh, that's great. Well, that's a, that's a big conversation. We, uh, we can get into another time, but the, um, uh, well, actually, I mean, we could talk about it for like six hours because uh, <laughs> within that is, you know, the nuances of operations, uh, marketing and other channels, the sales process, culture, values, um, distributed workforce, et cetera. But, uh, but a bigger conversation than we can fully open right now. Um, I appreciate you carving out time. I think that at a variety of different levels, um, the experience that you've had through that one offer, one channel is tremendously valuable, uh, both to new people and people that are looking to expand into that one channel. And the lessons that you've gotten from it will be helpful for that, uh, Easy Pay Direct included. If people want to find out more about you, where do you want to point them? Yeah, I mean, they can go to uh, Instagram, just look me up, Bashar JK2. It's the one with a check mark because there's like a dozen other Bashar JK2s that are just spelled a little differently. So make sure it's the one that's verified. And uh, if any of the other pages, you start following them or they start following you, 
they send you a link, please don't click on it because they will be scamming you. So just head on to my Instagram page. Love it, man. Bashar, good to see you. I appreciate you covering out the time. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you very much for having me.